Happy to see you. Good morning. Good morning. Lovely to see you. And uh, thank you, even though she's gone, to Sally for leading us through our service so far. Okay, who has a Bible? Okay, if you don't have one, perhaps you could briefly get hold of one, um, be it on your phone or if you would like a uh, real one, they can be made available to you uh, via the stewards from the back. If you'd like to be uh, handed a real one to borrow, please raise your hand and someone can get one to you, um, but we all need one for this part of our service. Thanks, Fred. Okay. This morning, I am going to uh, talk to you about something very controversial. <coughs> Are we ready for it? Marmite. <laughs> According to the advertisers, you either love it or you hate it. Who's a lover? Okay. Who's a hater? Fairly even spread, okay. Now I'd hate to say it, I think I might have bucked the trend. Because in, in, in theory, I love the thought of Marmite. And there are days when, when, when I think I might be pregnant, I crave it. <laughs> and I think, you know what, I'd really love some Marmite right now. And then I go and I buy it, and I, and I make a, a, some toast or a sandwich with Marmite, and then when I have it, it's really not all that. So I'm, I'm, I'm not a lover, I'm, I'm not a hater, I'm somewhere in the middle. Um, but most of us uh, in the nation are apparently divided uh, by Marmite, whether we love it, whether we hate it. There's something else that in church today is divisive. You are either for it or you are against it. Uh, there seem at the moment to be plenty of things in church that are divisive. Uh, this morning I want to think about one of them. And that is the position or the role of women in leadership and ministry. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I would guess, like Marmite, that you are either completely in favour or completely against. And there might be some who are kind of in the middle and not sure. The Church of England right now... Oh, it's split on a whole load of things, but one of them is the role of women in, in leadership and ministry. It's a divisive, sometimes controversial, sometimes sensitive topic. At our church meeting on Tuesday, we as a church will potentially be discussing and making a historic decision in the history of and the life of this church. Right now, our constitution, the rules by which the church operates, uh, say that a pastor or an elder in this church can only be male. Deacons can be male or female, uh, but the pastor and elder must be male. Uh, we discussed it as a leadership team recently and um, are now putting it to the church, uh, to you, the church members, for discussion um, about whether or not now might be the time for us to lift that restriction. And so this morning is time for us to open that can of worms for ourselves. If you are visiting us today, very warm welcome to you. Um, I owe you a little bit of an apology. We're not normally like this, um, but this morning uh, I'm going to take some time to look specifically at an issue uh, for us as a church and not necessarily preach uh, about a passage and apply points to our lives. Um, so do bear with us this morning, uh, but it's an important time for the church. Let me, as we get going, nail my colours to the mast. I'm not telling the church what they should do. Simply before I start talking about the subject, I'll let you know where I stand. I am all in favour of uh, women serving and ministering in any area of church life. Uh, as a minister, as an elder, as a deacon. Um, so I, come Tuesday, I will vote in favour of lifting that restriction. And I share that with you just so that when I begin to unpack uh, scripture in a moment, yeah, we keep in mind um, where we're at. 
however, whilst that might be my position and my opinion, it is not a salvation issue. We are not saved by what we think about women in leadership and ministry. And so for that reason, I can fully understand and respect those who have a different opinion. And it's important that we discuss uh, the matter, which we will do on <coughs> Tuesday. I'm mindful as well that scripture can be used to justify anything. Those who are in favour of uh, all areas of leadership and ministry in the church being open to women will use scripture to justify it. Those who um, are not sure um, about that whole thing, uh, in all good conscience, will use scripture to back up their position. Scripture can be used to justify anything, particularly if you take verses in isolation and don't look at them in context. And so this morning, what we're going to do, I'm not going to preach on one passage, I'm not going to talk in detail about the verses that Tyler read, what we're going to do this morning is is, is just try to get an overview of this whole theme of of, of, uh, what the Bible says about women, specifically in positions of leadership and ministry. Uh, And we're going to look at the whole council of scripture. We're going to start at the beginning and we're going to work our way through to the end. We will look at passages that appear to back up the role of uh, women in leadership and ministry. We will look at the passages which are used to uh, say, no, that shouldn't happen, um, and everything in between. So if you've got a Bible today, it will be well used. Um, Can we pray before we start? Lord, thank you for your words. That is living, through which you speak, and your word which is the sole authority for our lives and for our church. Open our eyes as we look to your word today. And would you lead us? In Jesus' name. Amen. Right. By and large, we're going to start at the beginning and we're going to work our way through. Pretty much in order uh, that things come. And so, let's start uh, right at the beginning. Genesis chapter 1. We'll start in creation. Genesis 1, you'll know the creation story, and uh, it was uh, at the end of the, uh, the, 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 the sequence of creation uh, that humans were made. Uh, pick up with me verse 27. So, um, after everything, God created uh, human beings in his own image. Genesis 1, 27. God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and govern it. Reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. So, right at the beginning in creation, Genesis chapter 1, God made male and female, and he made them different, but he made them equal. They were different but equal. Both male and female are made by God in his image and were given authority over creation. Are you with me so far? Good, right. Still in Genesis, chapter 2. Chapter 2, and let's look at verse 18. So, some say that Genesis chapter 2 is a, uh, is a different creation narrative. Some say that it simply uh, expands and gives more detail um, on, the, on, on, on the order of creation. Uh, so, Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. Then the Lord said, uh, so in this, in this version of events, Man came first. Adam is there. Uh, Verse 18. Then the Lord said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. I want to think about that word. When God made woman as a helper for man, because he he realised that men weren't going to get on on their own, uh, he says, I will make a helper suitable for him. That word helper is important. Uh, He doesn't mean, I will make an assistant. He doesn't say, I will make somebody who is in some way inferior to the man. I will make a helper. The same word that is used is used countless times throughout the Bible. Uh, And in the Old Testament, two-thirds of the time that this word helper is used, it is used to describe God as our helper. 
Let me give you an example. You don't need to turn to this one. Uh, Psalm 33, verse 20. We put our hope in the Lord. He is our help and our shield. God as our helper is in no way inferior to us. But he is our helper. Woman, according to Genesis 2, was made as a helper, uh, but no suggestion uh, that that is in any way inferior to the man. Uh, in the New Testament, the equivalent is used uh, to describe a fellow worker. Uh, we'll, we'll come across some of the passages later when Paul describes uh, God his, as fellow workers with him in Christ Jesus. Um, it's an equal playing field. Okay, we get out of Genesis and let's head into Exodus. And in Exodus chapter 15, we meet Miriam. Exodus 15, verse 20. Exodus 15, verse 20. Then Miriam the prophet, Aaron's sister, took a tambourine and led all the women as they prayed their tambourines and danced. Uh, and Miriam sang this song. Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. He has hurled both horse and rider into the sea. Now the context of that, if you look at Exodus chapter 14, um, is it's just after uh, God has led the Israelites to safety through the Red Sea. He's uh, parted the sea. Uh, and, and the Israelites have escaped, and then the sea closed on the, on the Egyptians who were, who, who were chasing them. Immediately after that happens, uh, there's, there's, there's a bit of a, as you can understand, praise party going on. And as part of that, Miriam, uh, the prophet, took a tambourine, led the women as they played. Now, what I want us to focus on about Miriam isn't the fact that she took a tambourine and led the people in their praise. It's the fact that Miriam was a prophet. What is a prophet? anyone? Not necessarily that foresees the future. Sometimes they might. A prophet is somebody through whom God speaks. A prophet is somebody who, who, who speaks God's word to a people. Miriam, as a prophet, was used by God to speak to God's people. That's Miriam. Look forward a few pages. After Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, into Judges. Uh, Judges chapter 4, we see Deborah. <coughs> Judges chapter 4, and uh, verses 4 to 7 uh, introduce Deborah to us. Deborah, uh, we see the wife of uh, Lapidoth, was a prophet, again, somebody used by God to speak, who was judging Israel at the time. Uh, verse 5, she would sit under the palm of Deborah, uh, she had her own tree, between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim, and the Israelites would go to her for judgment. Hmm. Verse 6, one day she sent for Barak, son of Ab Abinoam, who lived in Kadesh, the land of Naphtali. Uh, she said to him, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, commands you. Call out 10,000 warriors from the tribes, um, and I will call out Sisera, um, and I will give you victory over him. So, Deborah is a prophet. She is used by God to speak. People go to her for her advice, her wisdom, her judgment, and Deborah, look at the way, verse 6, she calls out Barak and tells him what to do. Keep that in mind when we get to the New Testament and the passages that talk about I, um, it, it is not acceptable for a woman to have authority over a man. Keep Deborah in mind. That's Deborah. Look forward a little bit more into the book of Two Kings. And we see a lady called Hulda. Two Kings chapter 22. Verse 14. Two Kings 22, verse 14. So Hilkiah the priest, um, Ahikam, Akbor, Shapam, and Asiah uh, went to the new quarter of Jerusalem to consult with the prophet Hulda. She was the wife of Shalom, son of Tikvah, son of Harus, the keeper of the temple wardrobe. So again, here is another female prophet, somebody who is used by God to speak, and a woman who is approached by men for advice and counsel. That's Hulda. And then we get Esther. Don't worry about turning to Esther. Esther gets. 
um, a whole book to herself. And Esther, in a nutshell, um, it, it is under the leadership and the, and the influence that Esther has as queen, in a position that she has been put there in that place of leadership and influence by God, under her influence, the lives of countless Israelites were saved. <coughs> Esther was told that she was in her position for such a time as this. God had placed Esther in a position of leadership and influence for a time and for a reason. That's the Old Testament. Just a snapshot. Now, when we look through the pages of the Old Testament, what we see is God making male and female equal. Woman given in creation to man, not as anybody inferior, but as an equal, as as a helper, as a fellow worker. We've seen women who are used by God to uh, speak to his people. Women who have been put by God into positions of leadership and authority. And then we get into the New Testament. Jesus. An argument that is often used is, well, Jesus, uh, he, he only chose male disciples. And it's true. Jesus' 12 disciples were men. There's very practical reasons for that. The very first wave of Jesus' uh, witness and his ministry was first of all to the Jews. Are you with me? Jesus reached out first to the Jews and then after that to the Gentiles. And so on that first wave of ministry, the only people who would have been suitable for ministry and witness to the people of Israel would have been Jewish males. And so Jesus' first round of disciples were all Jewish males. Beyond that, within within Jesus' wider circle of followers, there are countless women that are named and mentioned and used in powerful ways. Think about John chapter 4. We see the uh, Samaritan woman who Jesus meets at the well, and the woman that's been married uh, five times and is now living with someone that's not her husband. She becomes a follower of Jesus and, and one of the first evangelists. She goes running back to her village and says, come and see a man who told me everything I knew. And when they came back, some of those people became followers of Jesus as well. This woman was one of the first evangelists uh, of Jesus. Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8, the first three verses talk about some women who who, who followed Jesus. Soon afterwards, it says, Jesus began a tour of the need of the nearby towns and villages, preaching and announcing the good news about the kingdom of God. He took his 12 disciples with him, along with some women, who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Among them were Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons, Joanna, the wife of Chusa, uh, Herod's business manager, Susanna, and many others who were contributing from their own resources to support Jesus and uh, the disciples. Think as well of the resurrection. Easter Sunday morning at the tomb, the very first people to witness and then proclaim the resurrection were all women. That's Jesus. And then we get into the early church. Turn with me to Acts. Acts chapter 1. And uh, we see from verse 12. So just after your Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, uh, chapter 1, verse 12. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives. Uh, It was half a mile away. When they arrived, they went to the upstairs room of the house uh, where they were staying. Where am I? Acts 1. Uh, Here are the names of those who were present. Peter, John. James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all met together and were constantly united in prayer, along with Mary, the mother of Jesus, several other women, and the brothers of Jesus. So in the early church, the women are there, gathered with the men. Still in Acts, flick forward to chapter 16. (coughs) 
Acts chapter 16, we, we looked at these verses uh, a little while ago. It tells the story of the beginning of the Philippian church where uh, Paul uh, lands and, and, and he comes across Lydia and some other women. So Acts uh, 16, from verse 13, on the Sabbath we went to a little way outside the city to a riverbank uh, where we thought people would be meeting for prayer. And we sat down to speak with some women who had gathered there. One of them was Lydia from Theatira. A merchant of expensive purple cloth who worshipped God. And as she listened to us, the Lord opened her heart and she accepted what Paul was saying. She was baptised along with other members of her household and she asked us to be her guests. And she encouraged Paul and the others back to her house. By the time we get to the end of chapter 16, it is fairly clear that Lydia is one of, if not the, leader of the early Philippian church. At the end of Acts 16, verse 40, when Paul and Silas left the prison, uh, so Paul and Silas, are after they, they started converting people, they got arrested uh, for preaching, um, and they got let out miraculously. And then, when they left prison, verse 40, they returned to the home of Lydia. There they met with the believers and encouraged them once more. Why? Because the Philippian church is led by and based in Lydia's house. Still in Acts, chapter 18. Acts 18, verses 24 to 26. Uh, meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, an eloquent speaker, uh, who knew the scriptures well. Uh, Apollos is a, is a fairly uh, well-known and upstanding uh, speaker. Paul speaks highly of him when he talks about, I plant the seed, Apollos watered it, and God made it grow. Uh, Paul sees Apollos as a, what's the word, contemporary. Uh, a Jew named Apollos, an eloquent speaker who knew the scriptures well, had arrived in Ephesus from Alexandria. He had been taught the way of the Lord and he taught others about Jesus with an enthusiastic spirit and with accuracy. However, he only knew about John's baptism. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him preaching boldly in the synagogue, they took him aside and explained the word of God uh, even more accurately. Isn't that good? So there's Apollos. Apollos is a, is a, is a well-known, accomplished uh, speaker. And yet Priscilla and Aquila, now note that Priscilla is named before her husband, because she is the teacher here, takes him aside and teaches him even more. I love that little detail that we get. Okay, out of Acts into Romans. And Romans chapter 16. Originally this was going to be our Bible reading today, and uh, then when I saw that Sally had put Tyler to read, I thought that would be a little bit cruel. Um, Romans 16, verses 1 to 16, uh, I, I, I won't read it to us now, it's basically a list of names. Paul is writing to uh, the Roman church, and uh, at the end of his letter he, he, he passes his greetings, and he lists specific people in the Roman church to whom he would like his greetings passed. Uh, and there's a whole long list of names, of which, do you know what, let's have a go at reading it. Uh, I commend to you, Romans 16 from verse 1, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, who is a deacon in the church of Centria. Welcome her in the Lord as one who is worthy of honour among God's people. Help her in whatever she needs, for she has been helpful to many, and especially to me. Give my greetings to Priscilla and Aquila, my co-workers in the ministry of Christ Jesus. In fact, they once risked their lives for me. I am thankful to them. And so are all the Gentile churches. You see, their influence isn't just over the Roman church, it's over a whole number of churches. Also give my greetings to the church that meets in their home. Greet my dear friend, uh, Epenetus. He was the first person from the province of Asia to become a follower of Christ. Give my greetings to Mary, who has worked so hard for your benefit. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my fellow Jews who are in prison with me. They are highly respected, uh, Junia is a female, they are highly respected among the apostles uh, and became followers of Christ before I did. Greet Ampliatus, my dear friend in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our co-worker in Christ, and my dear friend Stachius. Greet Apelles, a good man whom Christ approves, and give my greetings to the believers from the household, that will include females, of Aristobulus. Greet Herodian, my fellow Jew. Greet the Lord's people from the household, again, of Narcissus. Give my greetings to Tryphena and Tryphosa. Uh, the assumption is that they were twin sisters, the Lord's workers, and to dear Persis, who has worked so hard for the Lord. 
Greet Rufus, whom the Lord picked out to be his very own, and also his dear mother, who has been a mother to me. Give my greetings to her, or them, to Phlegon, to Hermes, to Patrobus, to Hermas, and the other brothers and sisters who meet with them. Give my greetings to uh, Philologus, to Julia, uh, Nereus and his sister, and to Olympus, and all the believers who meet with them. Greet each other in Christian love. I think it's 20, 26 or 27 names are listed there. Nine of them are women. And of those, a number of them are listed as being in notable positions of influence or leadership. We mentioned earlier Priscilla. Most of the times in Scripture when Priscilla and Aquila are mentioned, Priscilla is mentioned first because she was the teacher. Philippians chapter 4. We will come across these words in a few weeks as we continue our series in Philippians when we get back to it. Uh, but we won't come at it from this angle. So Philippians 4, uh, we see these two women, Eudia and Syntyche, uh, who basically have had a bit of a falling out. And they're not getting on. And so Paul, as he writes the Philippians, says, Philippians 4, verses 3 and 4, I ask you, my true partner, to help these two women... They worked along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are written in the, in the, in the book of... Where am I? Uh, Philippians 4, verses 3 and 4. Uh, it's probably going to be 2 and 3. Now I appeal to you, dear Anne Syntyche, please, uh, because you belong to the Lord, settle your disagreement, and I ask you to help these two women, for they worked hard with me, there we go, co-workers, uh, in telling others the good news. They shared with Paul the preaching and the ministry of the gospel. Now we get on to the passages that are used most often to argue that actually men and women should have different roles and leadership and ministry in the church should not be conducted by women. Let's look at those. There's two passages that talk about it. Both of them are written by Paul. Um, so it's notable that Jesus didn't give any commands. There is nothing that God spoke through prophets. These are words that Paul wrote. It doesn't make them less valid, but it's worth pointing out. Uh, so, look with me. 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And from verse 33... We see. So this, this section, uh, Paul is talking to the church about uh, orderly worship. From verse 33, For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace, as in all the meetings of God's holy people. Verse 34, Women should be silent during the church meetings. <laughs> Amen to that. I'm joking. <laughs> Women should be silent during the church meetings. It is not proper for them to speak. They should be submissive, just as the Lord says, if they have any questions, they should ask their husbands at home, for it, for it is improper for women to speak in the church meetings. Now, you all have heard me say time and time again, context is everything. Let me tell you about the New Testament church. The, the, the early New Testament church, uh, since we're talking uh, largely about Jewish converts, would have followed a lot of Jewish customs. And so the church may well have been split, and women would have been in one place, and men would have been separate somewhere else. And as the word of God was being taught, the women, perhaps not understanding what was going on, or, or not really paying a lot of attention to what was going on, would start talking amongst themselves. That stops anybody else listening, and it's, I can tell you, distracting for the preacher. And so for that reason, Paul is saying, women, you need to stay quiet in church. He's not talking about women in the pulpit, he is talking about women in the congregation. Women must remain silent in the church meeting. So should the men, but it's not the men that are talking, it's the women. Some things never change. <laughs> He's talking about the congregation, not the leaders. 
Flick forward to 1 Timothy. This is perhaps a trickier one. 1 Timothy chapter 2. One Timothy chapter two, and let's look from verse eleven. Here's the other popular one, which is used to say, actually, it should only be men. One Timothy two, from verse eleven, women should learn quietly and submissively. I do not let women teach men or have authority over them. Let them listen quietly. Because God made Adam first, and afterwards he made Eve. And it wasn't Adam who was deceived by Satan, the woman was, was deceived. It's your fault. Uh, and sin was the result. He goes on, but women will be saved through childbearing, assuming they continue to live in faith, love, holiness and modesty. Uh, women should learn, I don't let them teach or have authority over men. Think back to Deborah. God clearly gave Deborah authority over men. Think back even in New Testament times to Priscilla. Priscilla was used by God to teach Apollos, amongst others. So it's clearly not a God-given blanket ban on women teaching and having authority over men. Again, let's come back to context. Paul is writing in a time when the Christian church is fairly young. And a lot of Paul's writings speak about the need to be sensitive to the times in which they are in. Where even if something is acceptable, if it's going to cause a problem for other people and therefore discredit your message, don't do it. It's why he says, you can eat whatever you like. Don't call anything unclean that God has made clean. But he goes on to say, if you're eating that, offend somebody else, don't eat it. Why? Because it's more important that the gospel message does not get discredited because people are put off by something that you're doing. Can I suggest but in exactly the same way, in the time in which this letter was written, it was the norm for men to be teachers and one with authority. And so for a woman to turn up and then start trying to teach, straight away they're, they're, they're ignored, they're not listened to, and, and it discredits or shuts down the audience for the gospel message. Can I remind us as well, that at the time in which we are talking about women would have been less educated than men. Education at the time was largely for men. Rabbis who chose disciples at the time, discipleship, where you uh, apprenticed to a rabbi and you followed them around, that was something that the men did. (coughs) Women were much less educated than men, uh, and so... When Paul writes, he then says, women should learn quietly and submissively. The emphasis of that verse isn't on their silence, it isn't on being quiet and submissive, the emphasis is on the learning. Women should learn. Because right now, they're way behind the men. We're going to go in a little bit more detail, but does that make sense so far? He carries on. The reason that he gives. For God made Adam first, and afterwards he made Eve. And it wasn't Adam who was deceived by Satan, the woman was deceived, and sin was the result. And he goes on, but women (coughs) will be saved through childbearing. Have you ever wondered what that means? What are we saved by? We're saved by grace, through faith in the Son of God. We're not saved by anything else. Being good doesn't save us. Childbearing does not save us. What he's saying is this. True enough, sin came into the world through a woman. Because whilst they both ate the apple, Eve ate it first. Ladies, I'm sorry, but it was your fault. 
Eve ate it first. Sin came into the world through a woman. But guess what? So did the Saviour. So did the Saviour. Jesus came into the world through childbirth. And so through childbirth, the birth of Jesus, we are saved. Therefore, the consequences of sin been dealt with. The consequence of sin, which in this case is saying, well, for now, you're not allowed to preach. Actually, you'll be saved through childbirth because Jesus came into the world through <laughs> childbirth. Which is why he goes on, assuming they continue to live in faith, love, holiness, and modesty. Can I suggest that they are the conditions for firstly women, but secondly anybody who desires to teach and lead, that it's not conditional on whether you're a male or female, it's conditional on A, you being saved, but also you living in faith, love, holiness and modesty. Are you with me? Let's go. Still in 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 3. the last of the passages that is often used. This is a trustworthy saying, if someone aspires to be an elder, uh, and you'll remember from uh, not long ago we spoke about there are two uh, positions of leadership within the church, that of elder, that of deacon, and so elder is the same as pastor and whatever. Um, so this is a trustworthy saying, if, if someone aspires to be an elder, a pastor, a leader within the church, he desires an honourable position. And so an elder must be a man whose life is above reproach. He must be faithful to his wife. He must exercise self-control, live wisely and have a good reputation. He must enjoy having guests in his home uh, and he must be able to teach. He must not be a heavy drinker or violent. He must be gentle and not quarrelsome and not love money. He must manage his own family well, having children who respect and obey him. For if a man cannot manage his own household, how can he take care of God's church? At verse 2, an elder must be a man whose life is above reproach. Again, can I suggest and put to us that he's writing about men because the cultural norm at the time was for men to be the ones in position of leadership, but the focus of these verses, the focus of the verses isn't the fact that it's a man, it's the fact that his lifestyle and his conduct has to be on point. The requirements of an elder and all those verses, they talk about lifestyle and faith and conduct. It's not about gender. Finally, the verses that Tyler read for us today. These are the verses that I'll leave us with. Galatians chapter 3. Verse 26 to 29. For you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ, like putting on new clothes. There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus, and now that you belong to Christ, you are the true children of Abraham. You are his heirs, and God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. So, now that you belong to Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave or free, male or female. Now, he's not saying they don't exist. Clearly they do exist. There are Jews and there are Greeks. There are people who are slaves and there are people who aren't slaves. There are men and there are women. And yet, as a follower of Jesus, none of those things define you. We are not to define or identify people by anything other than the fact that they are followers of Christ. And he closes by saying, now that you belong to Christ, 
you are his heirs, and God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. Who remembers God's promise to Abraham? He'll have many children, okay. Yes, that was. Um, that may not be particularly the promise that he's referring to, um, although, name it, claim it. Let me read to you an extract, part of God's promise to Abraham. Genesis chapter 12 is where we see God's promise to Abraham. The Lord said to Abraham, leave your native country, your relatives, your father's family, go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. You will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. Can I pick out two particular points from that promise? God's promise to Abraham, which is uh, true to all of us, and as we think about ministry, can I suggest that whether a minister, a preacher, a pastor is male or female, if they uh, are a follower of Jesus, this promise is true of them. Uh, The second half of verse 2, I... Uh, you will be a blessing to others. And verse 3, all the families on earth will be blessed through you. I put to you that as we look at the whole counsel of Scripture, from beginning to end, the good bits, the bad bits, the easy bits, the hard bits, everything in between, we see a God who made men and women equal. We see women who are used by God in positions of leadership, authority and ministry to do great things. On Tuesday, we will have a chance to discuss and potentially decide whether as a church we are willing to lift the restriction that is currently in place. Can I put out a disclaimer? Should we make that decision as a church? Well, firstly, when we come to make that decision, that decision is such a massive, historic decision for the church, it cannot be based on our opinions, on our preferences, on our desires. When we gather as church members, our responsibility is to seek the mind of Christ who speaks through his word. As we gather on Tuesday, our decision is what do we believe God says in Scripture? (coughs) Secondly, a disclaimer. (coughs) On Tuesday, should we decide to lift the restriction that will mean that either a male or a female uh, may be called uh, to the role of pastor or elder within the church, uh, that does not mean that automatically the next minister will be a woman. It does not mean that we have to appoint the first woman that turns up and applies for the role in exactly the same way that you wouldn't appoint the the first man that turns up for the role. Exactly as scripture has said, we hold women to the same tests as men, looking at their suitability, their lifestyle, their conduct, their calling. But what it does mean that if God should call and equip and send somebody who happens to be a woman, that we might be open to their ministry.